Bienvenidos, señoras y señores, to the Bleed Lows Podcast. This episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all your sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's the NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. So head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use our promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online, where the game starts. And joining us on the Carne Asada is the sports lawyer, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Evans. Uh, he is the host of the California Sports Lawyer Podcast, which you can find on the Believe, on the Believe Podcast Network. Jeremy, ¿cómo estás, amigo? Hey, ¿cómo estás? Uh, muy bien. How, how are you guys doing? There we go. See, now Jeremy is initiated into the show because he showed off his Spanish skills. So, <laughs> so Jeremy, we wanted to have you on because you are a lawyer. It's not just a name only uh, as the name of your podcast. You are a lawyer. So we wanted to talk about the legal aspects here of the Trevor Bauer thing. So the first thing I want to ask you is the question that everybody's been asking us ever since the Dodgers first announced that they were going to DFA him. Uh, and now they, the news has finally been released. It's been broke. And that is the Dodgers have officially released Trevor Bauer. So he is now free to sign with any team in Major League Baseball. But the comment that we got a lot on the show was he didn't commit any crime. So why are the Dodgers releasing him? So can you explain what, what's going on here, Jeremy? Yeah. No, well, Juan, and uh, it's so good to see uh, you and Roger, and and so glad to be with you guys, and so glad we got to connect recently. This situation is so interesting, and I think the sort of three things I would point to is I would compare it to the Colin Kaepernick situation and then the Ray Rice situation. And the reason why I bring those up is because I think that we can learn a lot about baseball and football uh, and a lot about the Trevor Bauer situation by comparing those situations. So if, if everybody recalls, the Colin Kaepernick situation was he didn't do anything illegal, but essentially no team wanted to sign him. And then eventually he ended up signing a settlement that, you know, essentially the argument was that the teams had colluded against him uh, to not have him play. But the argument that I had sort of made early on was that regardless of how you feel about Colin Kaepernick, he was making a decision that essentially said, I'm not going to follow the rules. Um, you know, if each of us, for example, want to be a part of a country club, we would have to follow the rules to be a part of that club. We wouldn't be able to show up wearing shorts if the rules said, you know, you can't wear shorts, you got to wear pants, that sort of thing. And that's sort of, it's interesting how football handled that situation. And then you compare it to the Ray Rice situation, which was, they suspended him initially for two games, and then when that video got released, they suspended suspended him, I think, for another four games, and he was never signed again by another team. And then you look at that compared to baseball, which I think what this really boils down to is that baseball has less of an appetite for controversy, meaning that the NFL has got a bigger appetite and a sort of uh, more room for players um, who get into trouble. I think that's partially because of the players union, but I also think it's just because the nature of the NFL versus baseball, baseball tends to be a more conservative sport. Right. And so I think essentially, uh, the Dodgers and the Dodgers tend to be a more conservative franchise. Uh, and I think they thought in the LA market, this is really going to be a tough sell to the fans and we're going to get beat up pretty bad in the press. Uh, I am sure that they had those discussions uh, in their sort of uh, in the front office. And so it's really less of a legal issue and more of a PR issue. And uh, that sort of was sort of my sort of assessment of the situation uh, that Trevor Bauer uh, was never going to play again for the Dodgers because 
those facts, even though he committed no crime, um, I think baseball found that sort of, hey, you know, you've you've violated our you know policy on um, you know basically good behavior, and uh, we're going to discipline you for that. Now, does Trevor Bauer have any sort of rights to maybe go against uh, baseball or the Dodgers? Possibly, uh, particularly baseball, uh, where if he could find, um, if he could get a judge and a jury to find maybe that uh, they had violated his rights and he didn't have due process, because you know he was suspended for quite a bit, period of time, and you know obviously fulfilled some of that, and they relieved the rest of the sentence through that arbitrator. Uh, but now he potentially doesn't have a career. Uh, because I don't know if another team's going to sign him, um, but that was sort of my assessment on it. Hopefully, that's that's helpful. No, I, I really I, I like the, the the fact that you brought in the Kaepernick. I never really thought about the Kaepernick uh, comparison, but also I mean, when you use the country club, we we were talking about this, uh, Roger and I, about the fact that okay, he didn't commit a crime, but he did violate the policy, and that's what the arbitrator said. That, you know, to the point where he not only violated the policy, but they gave him the longest suspension in the sport. So that's something I want to ask you, Jeremy. Do we, I know they, they won't release any of the facts of the case or anything like that. But when we look back, we saw Julio Urias himself was suspended 20 games under this policy. Um, and then we had also Marcelo Suna. He also got suspended 20 games. But Trevor Bauer got suspended 324, and then the arbitrator reduced it to 194. What could have that uh, arbitrator have seen to reduce from 324 to 194? No, that's a really good question. And I think the the point I would take a step further when comparing Ray Rice to Colin Kaepernick to um, to uh, Trevor Bauer is that it really just comes down, it's not even really a legal principle to me, and I, I may be in the minority by saying this, but it really comes down to the point that you catch more bees with honey, right? Meaning that if, for example, Trevor Bauer was not a controversial figure off the field, as well as he is on the field, and he had come out and apologized not for the incident, because if he felt that he truly didn't do anything wrong and it was consensual, but apologized for the way that it put the team in a bad, you know, sort of role and all that, I, you know, I, I have, I'm convinced that the Dodgers would have brought him back. And, and if he would have apologized and taken a different approach to it, obviously he's still fighting it and going for his rights. Of course, I think that, you know, that in my opinion, that was admirable that he fought in court uh, and that he was fighting for, you know, his reputation, whether you like him or not, I think that was admirable that he did that. But I think Trevor Bauer's antics on and off the field really kind of prevented uh, the Dodgers from bringing him back. As far as what the arbitrator thought, I, you know, I think it's one of those things where just like in the criminal setting where you get brought before a judge and the judge says, Hey, you've served, you know, a hundred days in jail. Uh, you know, we're going to consider that time served for, for the crime that you've committed. And I think the arbitrator looked at this in a sort of in a civil setting and said, well, you were suspended for 324 games. You've served 190 of them. It, it, you've basically done your part. You know, you, you've been, you've been out for a, you know, a little over a season or a little less than a season and a half. That's sort of how I think the arbitrator looked at it. Um, I think he probably also realized that, no team was going to sign him. So at the end of the day, even if whether he served 324 games or 190, a team wasn't going to sign him. So what did it matter whether he had, you know, another 100, 100 games to serve? That would sort of be my assessment of that. So, Jeremy, going back again to the comparison of Colin Kaepernick, if, you know, he's been, they, they released him. So basically the Dodgers were not able to work out a trade with anybody. So the belief is maybe nobody wants him. We've already seen some people leaking information. The Mets aren't interested. The Yankees aren't interested. The Chopins aren't interested. But that just may be strategy, right? Because why why trade when you can just sign the guy on waivers for the league minimum? If for some reason no team does end up signing him, and it's what you mentioned before, where this guy's career is over, 
He's still going to get his $22 million from the Dodgers, but would he have a case? Would it be something? Some people believe that Barry Bonds was blacklisted towards the end of his career because of the steroid thing. Would Bauer actually have a legal claim saying that, you know, these owners colluded to not, because again, using the argument, I served my time. I did not commit a crime. I, you know, I think so. I think there is a claim there. Here's the issue though, right? And it's similar to Ray Rice or it's similar to Colin Kaepernick in that if you make that claim, and of course, Ray Rice, you know, there was obviously video evidence of him committing domestic violence. So a little bit different in that sense, right? Uh, but um, I think it's interesting because even if he could make the claim, a successful claim uh, that baseball colluded, the the question becomes, what's the remedy, right? And, and would he have the power or would the court have a power to reinstate him to a team? And that's the tricky part because the court would not be able to force any team to bring him back. They, he might be able to get money out of it and say, you guys colluded, kind of like with Colin Kaepernick, almost the exact same situation in that, Colin Kaepernick uh, sued and they settled and they basically paid him money. And there was the argument that he potentially made more money in that settlement than he did in his NFL career. You know, that was sort of some of the information that came out at that time, even though the settlement was under seal and all that. But that's sort of, I, that's sort of my thoughts on that. You know, Juan, I, you know, it, it is interesting and, and I'm sure Bowers camp, he would love to play again. Um, but regardless of whether you filed suit, uh, he would not a court would not be able to force a team to sign him and to put him on a team. And I think that's the that's the rub of it all. He could get money, but he would not be able to be uh, to be able to be on a team without a team willfully signing him. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot being made of the fact that, well, look, we're going to pay him and he's going to end up playing for another team. You had mentioned earlier that this was not about, you know, committing a crime or anything like that. This was about PR. And this was about the hit that the Dodgers were going to take uh, if they did. I mean, at this point, when they when Major League Baseball reinstated them, was the mystery completely taken out of it? There's no way the Dodgers could have brought him up. I mean, is there a possibility that the Dodgers could have brought him back and said, look, this guy served his time. This situation has been, it's done. It's over with. It's, it's been resolved. Yeah. That's such a good question, Juan. And I'll tell you, if, if I was in the front office of a team, I mean, I think, look, you have, you have your morals, you have your ethics, you have your values, right? And I'm sure the Dodgers had a discussion and they said, well, you know, here's our values. Do we want to have a player on a team? And, I, and by the way, I think another big piece of this was the fact that some of the players on the team uh, allegedly did not want him to play on the team. I think that plays a big role in this. Because one thing we've seen about the Dodgers front office and ownership is that they do care about character guys. You look at all the guys that they're bringing in, Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman. These are all like good reputation guys. Um, the, the farm system, they draft the same way. Uh, they're really looking for clean cut um, sort of guys not to make waves or controversy. And I think people that's pretty consistent on the Dodgers of late under this new ownership group. And so I think that played a part in it. But, you know, I also have to say that I think that there is a blueprint for, if, let's say the three of us were in a front office. I think that there's a blueprint to where you can bring somebody back that way. And, and one is you issue, you issue a genuine apology and the, the player does some level of community service and, and shows genuine changing in uh, their, their sort of ability and the way that they've handled something. And then I think uh, the team sort of takes, you know, issues a statement and sort of explains why they're making that decision. They bring the player back and maybe even um, you wouldn't be able to do this because of the league rules, but, Maybe in some other leagues, you might be able to reduce the salary and say, hey, the player's taking a pay cut or donating his salary to a domestic violence charity or something like that. That, to me, would be the blueprint to bring him back. But I just don't think 
the Dodgers are willing to do that in this setting uh, because the facts were so public, number one, and two, because I think Trevor Bauer had a personality that was not conducive to that. And I think three, the players were pretty uh, adamant. Again, we don't know. We weren't in the locker room, but the players were pretty adamant about not bringing him back. I think those three things really kind of prevented Bauer from coming back to the Dodgers. And it may be the same thing that prevents him from pitching again. So, so Jeremy, I, I, I don't know if it this is from Trevor Bauer himself, if it's from his lawyers, if it's from his PR people around him, but did they do him a disservice? Is there a huge malpractice here by not telling him to shut up? Because the examples that you, you had mentioned before, Julio Diaz, when this happened, I felt like Julio Diaz went into hiding. We, you didn't hear anything about Julio when he had his dust up. And it's like you said, he came back and he was welcome on the team. And it was like, issues resolved. All right, we're, we're moving on. But because Trevor Bauer didn't do everything that you just said he did, I mean, is it a possibility they gave him this advice and it was just him that was just like, no, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'm not going to do this? Yeah. No, good question, Juan. And and, and I, I, I agree with you. I think any any you know front office worth their salt would have given him that advice and said, hey, here's our step-by-step -step plan to get through this. And if you look even recently, the Dana White situation with, with UFC, yeah. there's this video of him and his wife in Cancun. And what does he do? He immediately comes out. They both make a statement. They both admit what happened. They apologize for it. And you have not heard much of it since that point, right? I think Trevor Bauer was in this interesting situation where – now, obviously, Dana White's the president of the company, so it's a little bit different because he's the employer versus the employee, right? But with Bauer, he was in this interesting predicament where, on one hand, he wanted to clear his name. But two, he sort of had this investigation with the Pasadena Police Department – MLB was also doing a you know an investigation. So he had one role of trying to clear his name, but then the other side of it was that in many ways he really couldn't um, follow the Dodgers sort of advice if they had given that to him because he really had to fight this court case. Uh, at least that was sort of, I think, his, his approach in terms of his legal strategy. But I'll say this, though. I, I personally think that there was a way to do both. I think that Bauer could have issued a statement, apologized for, you know, putting the team in a bad situation, apologized to the ownership. He could have addressed the team, you know, in person, said he was sorry for it, and then gone about in private fighting the case. I think that would have been the proper way to do it. But um, as we all know, it was not handled that way. I, you know, Jeremy, I... I always, I mean, Babyface and I have been talking about the fact that the risk if the Dodgers would run of bringing him back is much greater than any other team. And not only just dollar-wise, but in terms of the fact that obviously the trust has been broken between Trevor Bauer and the Dodgers. So now, if any team does go ahead and sign him, and look, pitching, you're always going to need pitching. So there might be a team desperate enough that's going to go on a limb here and take it. But for me, this story isn't over. I mean, from my understanding, he already has a trial date set up in February of 2024. There are five defamation suits that are still ongoing. And the issue that we're running up against is also is yes, there were no criminal charges, but then again, it's not like the court said that this guy didn't batter or didn't assault this person. So if this team, if another team decides to take this on, it's not it's not issue resolved, right? Because of the fact that he's still fighting a lot of these cases. So they are gonna have to deal with this stuff. Right. Well, you know, another example too to this one is Deshaun Watson. And Trevor Bauer, right? Here's a guy who, you know, you've got 25, maybe 30 domestic or not, well, domestic violence or call them, I guess you wouldn't call domestic violence. I guess you call them, you know, uh, really sort of these, this idea of sort of either um, assault and battery or, you know, rape cases. And yet the Browns handed out, I think the largest contract in, in uh, NFL history for a quarterback, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. 
And it sort of just, I think, expels the differences between Major League Baseball and the NFL in terms of the risk level that they're willing to go to. I will say this, though. It, it's interesting, to your point, Juan, if, again, if, if the Dodgers or if Bauer would have handled this differently, I think it would have turned out differently. And I will also say this, and this is just a, human beings have a nature of, number one, uh, people have a tendency to forgive and forget. So there's this idea, and especially true when people win. So let's say that a team signed Trevor Bauer. There would be an initial onslaught of negative PR, you know, cancel this team, that whole thing. But if he was successful in that role and he legitimately showed interest in changing, I think he could be successful. And I might even take it a step further and say, even if he didn't show interest in changing and and being a different person, uh, I think people also would watch that for the entertainment factor and they would follow it and pay attention to it. Now, whether a team wants to take that risk is completely, um, you know, uh, I, I think a pretty high, you know, high risk. But anyway, that's th- those are my two cents about it. You know, uh, you gave me so many examples of football and then we could go to the NBA, but it just seems it's a good time to be a sports lawyer right now. Right, Jeremy? You're, you're always going to have work. Yeah, no, good point. And um, I tell you, I mean, you know, it, it, when I first started my practice, I, I did a little bit of agency work and I did a little bit of, um, you know, criminal defense work. And eventually, you know, after about six months to a year doing that, I got away from it because, um, you know, it's it's really tough to be around. And I, and I tell you, when I interview my clients, the client interview is so important, right? Because I'm looking for character. I'm looking for ethics and morals, right? Because the thing is you want to be dealing with with people that you trust and that you can be around, right? Because if you're going to work with somebody, you might as well like them, you know? So, uh, but yeah, no, it's an interesting time between uh, all the issues we're talking about, but then also uh, NIL and everything else. So uh, you mentioned ethics and and morals, and, and you had mentioned it before too. I, I think it's interesting, and obviously I think this is every fan has to answer this question for themselves, but I mean, these are people, and I, I'm all for people having a second chance. I believe I'm a sucker for a redemption story, right? Yeah. If you mess up, I, I believe that you should have the, the opportunity to, to make it right. And you had mentioned there was ways that Trevor Bauer could have handled this. He chose not to. But as a fan now, uh, I mean, should we just completely ignore? I mean, we're obviously rooting for a Dodgers, but I mean, I doubt this would happen, but crazier things have happened. But what if tomorrow we find out that Kershaw's a serial killer, right? Are we going to sit there and say, hey, but, you know, we need starting pitching, you know, like how much of it as a fan do we need to distance ourselves from it and just be like, look, I don't care about what's off the field. I only care about what's on the field or should I care about like you had mentioned yourself, you want to like your client, you want to trust your client as fans. What is our relationship now like to, to these athletes? Yeah, that's such a good question. Juan. and I tell you, I think I, the first thing that comes to mind is this old quote that I would hear about like Rome, right? In Roman days when, uh, the emperor wanted you not to pay attention to something. He would stick games in front of you and he would say, enjoy these games. Right. And I think sometimes that we as Americans do a lot of that, right. Cause we sit back and we go and people in the world in general, I think every culture does this because you want something to root for. You want something to be excited about and you want something that doesn't have societal pressures. Right. So I think it's natural, but to your point, It is interesting because you have to take a value proposition. And I'll tell you, like in my personal life, like, you know, I really, I stay away from fantasy sports. Um, Mm -hmm. I stay away from watching every single game because I want to have that balance. Right. And then in in similar ways, it's kind of like the entertainment space, because sometimes if you see an actor uh, do something, you're like, man, that's terrible. But then do you still go watch their movies? And can you separate that? Right. So it's tough. I mean, to me, I think on one hand, you have to be human and you have to realize that people are human. They make mistakes. Uh, and of course, you see that on Netflix, people are enamored by these like 
these murder mysteries and mm -hmm. these like true stories about, you know, Richard Ramirez and all this. So in some sense, there's a little bit of sickness out there. <laughs> I think that people, you know, enjoy the, uh, enjoy some of that, but um, it is such a good question. And I think everybody has to have their own moral compass about what's right and what's wrong. Um, and you got to try to find a good balance there, but it, it is a good point because how would you treat somebody, um, you know, it, it's almost like in the movies, like where you've got, uh, you know, uh, a villain in the movies, but somehow the villain is lovable, right? Um, what was that television show? Uh, Dexter. I think it was Dexter yeah. where the guy would basically go out and like murder people, but somehow people watched that and thought that it was entertaining. So it, again, you bring up such a good point and I, and I think it's just so personal, um, and, and, and interesting, I, I think, to say the least. Well, I, I, the reason I, I brought it up is when the news first hit, you know, I, I went in hard uh, on Bauer. And I'm still not convinced. Uh, I mean, no matter how many times I talk to people and they tell me he didn't do anything, it was consensual. And I'm like, look, there's a story in the Washington Post that there's a recorded police phone call where he admits he hit her. He just didn't think he hit her that hard. We're going to get into semantics now in terms of what is consensual or, or, or not, but it just did kind of make me, now that this is over and they've released him and there's a good chance that this guy is never going to be able to play again, it does make me think a little bit about, okay, this guy just lost his career. Does he deserve to lose his career? Should he have the opportunity to play again? Those are questions now that I'm asking myself where, you know, if I messed up now, again, I would like to assume that I would own up to it, but I would like that opportunity to, to redeem myself. And that's what I'm curious is, is going to to see what happens if yeah. another team, everybody right now is saying no, but you know, spring training happens and there's an injury and everybody might change their mind. Yeah. So no, I, I go ahead, Jeremy. No, no, no. Go, go ahead, Juan. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I wanted to segue to your podcast. I wanted to give you some time to, to, to promote this thing because you have your own podcast, which, again, you can listen to on the Believe. You'll find it on the Believe Podcast Network. What kind of stuff do you talk on your show? No, thanks, Juan. And it's such a pleasure to, to, to speak with you and see you and um, hoping we can get together soon again, my friend. But uh, so I've been doing it. This is I'm in the fifth season now. We've got, you know, a hundred and I do an episode a week, but 179 episodes now. I like to bring on guests, you know, similar to your show, whether it be like general counsels of teams or um, CEOs of leagues, you know, uh, commissioners, that sort of thing, uh, lawyers, agents, the whole thing. And I try to bring them in and talk about their career pass, talk about how they do deal making, talk about how they make decisions, how they network with people. So in many ways, it's educational in the sense that you learn about how a person has become successful, but then it's also you learn the insights to the industry. So, you know, we talk about entertainment, media and sports, and we talk about contracts and deal making. Uh, we have a lot of fun on it. And similar to you guys, I will talk about like trends in the industry. So I'll talk about, you know, uh, where streaming is going and where artificial intelligence is going and technology and how those things all play together with entertainment and sports. But um, we have a lot of fun with it. And, you know, you guys are creatives as well. And, you know, frankly, I just do it for the love of it. I do it for the love of creating content and um, and just see where that takes me. All right. Well, we're going to end the show the way we always end the show. So now that you are a carnal of the carne asada, Jeremy, <laughs> we have to initiate you. So, we're going to do a segment here that we like to call our kickback questions. And they're just little quick rapid fire um, questions here. But I, I noticed there was a lot of California schools uh, on your resume. Are you are you a local boy? I am. Yes. Born and raised. So what part of California were you born in? So I uh, grew up born in Northridge Hospital, grew up in North Hollywood um, for I think it was like the first, I don't know how many months of my life. Then we moved out to Moore Park and then um, spent basically age six through 18 in Palmdale. So that's the, those were my formative years. 
All right. So uh, uh, what was your, I know you said you try not to watch sport, uh, a lot of sports, but what was your favorite sport growing up or still is your favorite sport? Baseball by far. I think the only thing that competed with that was when Jordan played for the Bulls. I used to love watching Jordan play, uh, but it's always been baseball. And your favorite baseball team, sir? The Dodgers, sir. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the only answer right there. This man, he gets us. He gets the show. All right. Here's another way we're going to find out whether you get the show. Are you a fan of the WWF? And I say WWF, not WWE. I'm talking about the golden age, Jeremy. Yes, I am. The Hulk Hogan, the Ric Flairs, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So who is your favorite wrestler? I think growing up, it was Hulk Hogan. I used to have the figurines and all that. Um, I wasn't so much into it, but Hulk Hogan, I loved, I think as I've gotten older, I've gained an appreciation for Ric Flair. Uh, the guy's a character. So absolutely. And for those of you who have not seen the documentary on Ric Flair on the Peacock, you, you should check it out. That man has, has lived a life and you know, things were going so great, Jeremy. I loved having you on the show, but then you told me you're a Hulk Hogan fan. I am a fan of the macho man, Randy Savage. So I have a hatred for the pukester and everybody loyal listeners know that for me, the pukester is everything that was wrong with wrestling. And to our listener, Jerry Deyes, it's all about Savage and it's always been about Savage. So, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so now we're going to end the show with the last question. And this is what we ask everybody, Jeremy. So uh, on the, on the bleed Lose podcast, we're about the Dodgers. We're about LA but we're also about taco culture. So we need to know what is your favorite taco and where do you go to get that taco? Yes, sir. So there is a place in downtown LA that I absolutely love and adore. It's called Casa La Donna. And uh, it's on the corner of, I want to say lost, no, corner of Maine and like ninth, I think. Maine and ninth. And amazing tacos. I think it was Tuesdays. They had like dollar twenty-five tacos, uh, pretty good size, and they had an amazing taco bar, uh, or, or not sorry, salsa bar, where you would go. You'd have maybe about twenty different salsas that you could choose from. That place is awesome. Uh, my favorite spot by far. Uh, Guisados is pretty good too, um, but I think Casa La Donna was number one. I also do a lot of cooking, so I make my own salsa and own tacos at home too. Oh, look at this. So when I go to Casa La Donna and I drop your name, what kind of taco should I order? You know, I they they had some interesting ones on the menu. They had cactus tacos, potato tacos. Um, I always kept with really – I would basically do five and five. I would do five chicken tacos, five carnitas tacos, and I would get maybe like five or six different salsas. Um, but you got to be careful, brother, because – some of those were like the habanero ones or what have you. Oh my God, you'd be your mouth would be like on fire. But it was so good, you were like, "Give me more, give me more." <laughs> so. Wow, so you're a big salsa guy, then, huh? You're this is like you know, to many people, the protein is what's important, or or the tortilla. But it sounds like to you, maybe the salsa is more important than the tortilla or the protein. Do, the salsa and the tortilla is. Uh, to me, look, the protein is great. Don't get me wrong. I'll spend time marinating that. Carnitas can be be amazing. Um, don't get me wrong. But I, I yes, you got me. I think I think the salsa piece is – I'll die for salsa, man. Salsa is awesome. <laughs> well, let's go two for two, Jeremy. Piss me off here. What, uh, flour or corn? Corn. Oh, you're good. You redeemed yourself. Now go back and watch videos of the Macho Man Randy Savage, Jeremy, and come over to the light side. All right. The, come over to the hope. So I there will. you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank our, our carnal, our, our new friend of the carne asada, Jeremy Evans, the sports lawyer. He has his own podcast. He is the host of the California Sports Lawyer, which you can check out on the Believe Podcast Network. Check out his stuff. Jeremy, again. Thank you so much for lending your, your knowledge and your expertise to this subject matter. Pleasure, my friends. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to Jeremy Evans, the <coughs> California sports lawyer, for joining us on the show and giving us a, uh, a legal perspective, so to speak, on, on the Trevor Bauer situation. We've talked a lot about the baseball aspect of Trevor Bauer. I just feel like there's five pending cases that are still 
that are five defamation suits actually that are still ongoing. So I just don't think this thing is ever going to end. But at least for the Dodgers now, it, it's over. They have released him. We don't have to think about Trevor Bauer. We don't have to. What are they going to do? The Trevor Bauer saga is officially over now. Babyface, what what are your thoughts now that they finally released him? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it, it's it's over on the Dodgers end. I mean, you're probably still going to hear, you know, some fans, you know, bring him up depending on, you know, if he gets picked up by anybody and, and you know, how he does. You know, if he goes on and gets picked up by somebody and he goes on and wins Cy Young Award, you're never going to hear the end of it, right? But, yeah, I mean, now it's, you know, anything that happens, you know, whether he goes and plays, you know, and he goes on the straight and narrow, you know, good for him, you know, uh, that's the thing, right? You don't you didn't know what to expect from Trevor Bauer going forward, right? You know he can go sign with another team, be the perfect guy, perfect teammate, have no other issues. But we know, you know, he still has some of these suits that are that are that are gonna, you know, could be a distraction, you know. Um, and you know, you never know what else could come out going forward, and you never know how he's gonna act as a as a just as a teammate, right? As a player, you know, we've seen the dust ups he's had in Cleveland and. And stuff like that. So now, you know, you know, if I'm Trevor Bauer, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get on a team, you know, I'm going to make sure, you know, I'm just completely in and just, you know, just do my thing. And, and you know, you know, but does Trevor Bauer have that in him to just go and just, you know, kind of stay quiet under the radar and, you know, play his game? You know, it remains to be seen. So the Dodgers were not able to work out a trade with any team. I know I had heard reports, and this is what I hate about you hear these reports. And it like the one thing with Chapman, Araldis Chapman, that it just turned out that was not true at all, that that was all BS. But there were reports, and I don't know if you had heard these reports, that the the Twins of Minnesota were maybe a possible trade partner for, for Bauer. But, you know, the final hour came, and... Nothing came out of it, and the Dodgers ended up releasing him. I know you've said this before. Why would anybody give up an asset to try to give Trevor Bauer when you can go ahead and sign him for for the league minimum? Right? And I'm sure maybe if there was, like, we've already heard the Yankees, the Mets, the show pods, they have all said that they're not going to pursue him. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there's going to be no team that is going to pursue him? Yeah. I mean, back to your question, like, why would, would you have trade for him? I mean, you'd trade for him because you'd get him, right? Like, say if, you know, you're the Twins and you'd be like, okay, we'll pay, f- you know, $5 million of his salary, right? And, you know, he's coming to your team. Like, you know, if he hits the open market now, depends on who's going to be interested in him. If there's going to be teams that are interested in him, you know, maybe he doesn't want to go play for the Twins, you know, and he picks the... Uh, the Red Sox or whatever, right? You know, so you'd have that. He'd, he'd have to, you know, you'd, you'd have to deal with that as a team. But, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, a guy like Trevor Bauer, right, you know, former Cy Young, you know, we know if this guy pitches, he's probably going to get you maybe 15 to 20 wins, right? I mean, what team wouldn't want that, right? I think, you know, out of all the teams, right, all the other 29 teams are going to be like, yeah, we're interested in Trevor Bauer, but can we take the risk? Can we take the PR hit that's going to come along with it? That, you know, I don't think the net, the the New York teams are going to do it. You know, the Padres, I don't think are going to do it, right? I don't think even the Giants would do it. So it's like, is there a team out there that's willing to take that PR hit? Is it, you know, maybe somewhere like Minnesota, Cincinnati, maybe a smaller market, you know, and take that blow a little bit and then eventually it goes away? Well, I I know you've heard from your sources that it seems that no one's going to sign him, right? From what you've been hearing, it seems that no major league team is interested in it. Is that what you heard? I mean, that's what I've kind of seen. Like, that's what they're saying. I mean, but you, you I mean, you don't, you don't believe know. It. Like, you don't believe uh, it. I still think there'll be a team. I mean, but like you said, I mean, there is that everything that comes along with Trevor Bauer. Like, we, we've kind of mentioned this, like, Okay, yeah, you can say he's innocent, right? He's he he's innocent. He didn't do anything, but it is what it is, right? He he is attached to the situation, and that's not going to go away. So it is what it is. He has that baggage, you know. Unless his accusers all came out and said, like, you know what, he didn't do anything, 
then maybe that would probably like completely clear his name. But as, as it is right now, it is what it is, right? And he has that that baggage, so it's going to be tough for a team to want to touch him. You know, it's like, you know. Well, I thought I thought Jeremy's comparison to Colin Kaepernick was interesting, in the sense, uh, I, I it's not necessarily apples to apples, right? But Jeremy, we talked about you know that this is in a sense maybe a morality type situation. There's a lot of people that didn't agree with what Colin Kaepernick did. Right. Was it something criminal that he did? No, but they didn't they didn't agree with what he was doing. I think the same can be applied to Trevor Bauer. I know a lot of people say there was no criminal charges. But then again, the judge didn't say either way that there was proof or there wasn't. All the judge basically decided was that he was no longer a threat to this woman. And it was the D.A., the prosecutor, who just decided not to pursue this case. So I, I just find it really interesting now to sit there and, and you look at Trevor Bauer and if he does end up playing, yeah, like Jeremy said in the beginning, there's probably going to be a huge kerfuffle about it. People are going to be upset and all that stuff. But I am curious to see how long it goes. And again, Jeremy told us, look, the plan was this. And I know you've said this, Babyface. We've talked about it on our YouTube shorts. If you guys haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure you, you subscribe because you're going to get exclusive content. And we've done a couple episodes on Trevor Bauer on our YouTube shorts. And where you have said, if the guy would have shown any remorse, not, not necessarily like Jeremy says that, uh, I'm sorry I did this. But just apologize to his teammates, to the team, that I've become this distraction, that maybe more people would be willing to accept him and be like, you know what, let's take him. Because I, I still go back to the fact that both Julio and Marcelo Suna got 20 game suspensions. Trevor Bauer got initially 324. They reduced it to 194. So he must have done something like for them to give him the longest and not just by a little, but like completely, completely an outlier of a suspension compared to everything else. There's more to this. He must have done something. And because maybe he's done more than one thing, it was too much for Major League Baseball to ignore because we live in a society now where everything leaked. What if, and I know you've said this before, what if another story leaked out about something more heinous that he did and then the Dodgers are going to have to deal with, you let this guy come back after you? he did not, not only did he do this, but he did something else? Yeah, I mean, like I said, that, that's the risk, right? You don't know, you know, you can get Trevor Bauer, okay, yeah, I'm all in, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go, but you don't know what's hiding in the bushes, right? You don't know what else can come out. You don't know if there's anything else that's out there. And, like, I mean, I doubt if he goes to a team, right, and, you know, say you're the whatever, Orioles, right, and he's going to sign with the Orioles, and they tell him, okay, we need to know everything, everything that could possibly come out. Like, is he going to tell them the truth? Like, he's going to be like, well, there's nothing, right? There's nothing, nothing. I don't think there's – but you don't know. It, it's Like I said, it, it, it's hard, you know, he – just because he has that reputation kind of right he's he's the bad guy right and he and and like i said if he goes to play somewhere else he's going to have no problem being being the bad guy right and he i think that that kind of just motivates him for some reason like he he likes being that guy he likes being the villain yeah and you know like i said i don't know if baseball is kind of looking for a guy like that you know that that's going to be the villain and 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 kind of just be out there like that and it's, it's going to be a hard sell i mean if he doesn't if he doesn't sign anywhere this year you know maybe next year someone after some time you know sometimes gone some more time's gone by maybe somebody will be like okay you know what we'll take it we'll take a chance if he doesn't play this year that's almost going to be two and a half years that he has been away from competitive baseball and, and I know we talked about this on the YouTube short. We saw what taking a year away for what, what it did to David Price, you know, and Bauer is getting older. Maybe he's not at the same age that David Price was when he came back. But I, I am very curious 
the longer he goes without pitching this layoff, what that's going to do to people. And it's just, it's, I can't, you know, we asked Jeremy, we talked Jeremy, to Jeremy about this. It just feels like, was he just getting bad advice or was this just Trevor Bauer telling his lawyers, his PR people, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. I didn't do anything wrong. So I'm going to, I, I wonder if he realized, yeah, I know I could go this route and it's going to be better for my career. I'll go, I'll be returned to the baseball field quicker, but I didn't do anything wrong. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to play that game. Now, maybe it's an easier pill to swallow because he's still going to get 22 million this year, but he did lose a lot of money. And again, I just stress over the fact that, the other guys under this policy have gotten 20 game suspensions. This guy got game suspension in the hundreds. So whatever they had on him, and this was an independent arbitrator again. This wasn't somebody, you know, that favored Major League Baseball. This was an independent arbitrator. They saw enough to be like, we, we got to put this guy away for a while. Yeah, and... You know what? Like I said, it it just goes back to Trevor Bauer has always had kind of a bad rap, and I think unfortunately that all kind of came into play. You know, this was a shot for Manfred to like really stick it to him, and I think that's kind of what we saw. You know, everything that that he's ever done, kind of like this was their chance to punish him, and that's why it it was that long punishment. You know, I think that that all had something to do with it. Um, but you know. Like I said, we'll we'll see. I mean, it was interesting uh, when you asked if if he doesn't play this year, is there any like legal recourse that he can like say he doesn't play this year, right? And nobody yeah. wants him again, right? Nobody wants him to come play again. Like, is there any legal recourse that he could be like to sue MLB? Like, hey, you guys killed my career for nothing that was proved, right? Yeah. Like I I get what Jeremy said too about well, they can't force them to put him on a team, right? You can't do right. that, but but I mean, he could somehow legitimately sue, right, and 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 get some money out of that, right? You know, if he, if for some reason, like, okay, yeah, he's not going to play anymore, I, I could see him trying to sue MLB, like saying, like, you guys killed my career for no reason, right? Yeah, I, and that's why I asked him that because I am curious. I know everybody's just like, well, he got his money. What can he complain about? Look, I. It's different because Barry Bonds never got suspended. But there was that belief that towards the end of Barry Bonds' at the end of Barry Bonds' career, like he wanted to keep playing, but nobody would sign him. So in a sense, there was this belief that he was just blacklisted, where it's like, you need to go away, man. Like, we know that you did this. We know that you cheated. We can't prove it, but we know that you cheated. So your punishment aside from not being put in the Hall of Fame, is you just got to go away. And I, I, I'm i curious if if Bonds ever contemplated trying to go after, because we have seen Major League Baseball players do uh, present litigation against Major League Baseball. I mean, wasn't, didn't, maybe he didn't, but didn't Roger Clemens also try suing uh, because his reputation was tarnished. So I, I, I know that it's probably hard for the, it's a hard case for them to win, but there may be precedent of players fighting back and blaming Major League Baseball of collusion in the sense that you guys ended my career and there was no justification for you guys doing that. Yeah, I mean... I don't know if it'd be if if it, they'd go as that far as as like to collusion, you know. If you know MLB said like, "Hey, you know, stay away from this guy." I mean, you never know, right? I mean, it 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 could be something that could happen. I bet. I mean, we'll we'll see. You know, it's going to be interesting in the next couple of weeks. See if somebody picks him up. Um, his agent, you know, I, I've seen she she did a like one of those questions on IG, and people asked, "Is there interest for Bauer?" And she. You know, she's saying yes. I mean, obviously, she's not going to go with someone, hey, is there just a bout? She's going to say, no, no, there's no interest. But, you know, she's saying yes. You know, there's teams that are that are calling. Like I said, I, I legitimately feel, like I said, there's going to be teams calling. Now, if they can sign him and, and deal with everything that's going to come with that, that's a different story, right? 
Yeah, I, I'm in, I am, like I said, I, there's a part of me and I don't want to be a cynic, but I, like there probably is going to be a little bit of a, fl- a big deal in the beginning. But I'm just curious if it goes away because it takes a lot of energy to keep up that anger. And if you if he does, let's say, sign with a team in the Midwest or he signs with a a a a small market team, those places. And and you've said this before, you know, there was already people lining up organizations already lining up to protest against him, to picket against him, to demonstrate against him. Now, in uh, larger markets like Los Angeles, New York, or Chicago, I I think there's large organizations like that. If he goes to a smaller market, maybe there's still demonstrations, but maybe they're not as big. Or maybe the number of groups aren't as as big as they are here. So those are all things that uh, that organizations are going to have to take into consideration. Is this all worth it? And as Jeremy said... You know, this seems like the Dodgers made more of a PR decision and not a baseball decision. And the other thing that I find really interesting is we still don't know which players were on the record or off the record of whether they wanted to play with him or not. I've already seen Dodger players duck that question when they're asked in public events, what do you think about Trevor Bauer, the Trevor Bauer situation? You already hear, I don't want to talk about it. And I'm sure that question is going to be asked in spring training when they report. It's going to be like, well, but we're never going to know whether these guys really, because I'm sure there are a bunch of people in that, not a bunch, but I'm sure there's players in that locker room that don't care about this. To be like, hey, dude, whatever he does in his own time, that, that's up to that, that's up to him. It doesn't affect me. As long as he's a good teammate, as long as he's producing on the field, that's all I care about. But we've talked about this also too. There's probably players in there that have wives that don't like what they see. They don't like what they read, and they're letting their husbands know, "Hey, you you can't play. I don't want you around this guy. I don't want you playing." And and even like the character stuff, like you know, we've heard like, "Oh, he's he's a bad teammate, whatever." and stuff like that but like you know what i mean these guys maybe some are cool you know some are pretty tight some are cool and hang out with but a lot of those guys they don't they don't hang out with each other right they go they go to the field they play the game right oh this guy did good for us cool cool you know he did he pitched a good game for us but that's it right and and we've talked to pitchers uh they say you know what pitchers and position players they're on different Schedules. different planes right they're on different yeah. schedules so they, they they never really even see these guys or talk to these guys so you know so hey trevor bowers on my team like yeah i don't i don't really like i don't care for him much whatever but you know he's gonna give us you know 15 wins cool uh, you know I'll, t- I'll sign up for that right and I, I don't really talk to this guy i don't i don't go hang out with him whatever right so you know that's that's how it is just like any other workplace right you know yeah the, you work in a place with 50 people. Do you talk to all 50 of those people? Are you cool with everybody? No, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we sit there and say the Trevor Bauer saga is over. It's done. We don't have to talk about Trevor Bauer anymore until a rival, a division rival, or someone the Dodgers face end up signing him. And then we're gonna. it's going to bring it all back again because I know Dodger fans are pissed that the Dodgers are paying this guy. And if he ends up playing for another team, the Dodgers are going to basically be paying him to beat us. You know, that's one thing that I have noticed um, just being online on socials, you know, Instagram, Twitter. A lot of people are mad at the Dodgers right now. There is a yeah. lot of people that are pissed. And they're really angry, you know, just the, you know, slow off season, this Trevor Bauer stuff, the way they went out. I mean, people are pissed. The Dodger fans are pissed. You know, it seems like it seems like a lot of those guys are saying, like, you know, they don't even want to be Dodger fans. And to me, to me, it's like, you know what? You don't want to be Dodger fan. So be it. Right. Don't be a Dodger fan. Right. You know, don't 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 jump on on the on the train, you know, in, in September, October, when it's playoff time, whatever. Right. But. There's a lot of people that are pissed right they now. They will. You know they yeah. are. Look, I don't have a choice. It's not that I want to be a Dodger fan. I am. I don't have a choice. Like, do you think I want this misery? Do you think I want to see my team, you know, I, mean, I want it to affect me the way it does? But it's mm-hmm. like, 
this is the team that I have an emotional attachment to. I can't sit there and go, I'm going to start rooting for another team. It's not going to be the same. The Dodgers are my team. They always will be my team. But exactly. yeah, we, we, we've talked about this with Dylan before. Where So that's why I also think it's very interesting to see how the season progresses. Because if they end up going, getting to a slow start, getting off to a slow start, or things just go horribly wrong, and they're not competitive, and they're not fighting for the division, they're not even fi fighting for a playoff spot, that anger might continue. Because well, people are going to be like, and then if you start hearing reports, you know, that maybe they're already over the, the luxury tax. Now you're going to start, well, well, wait a minute. Why aren't you guys spending more money? Like, what are you guys doing? And that's the thing, though, too. Like, listen, people are upset. Like, the Dodgers aren't making moves. Yeah, they haven't made moves this off season, But, I mean, you're acting like it's it's the, you know, the Orioles or somebody, right? I mean, this team still has Mookie Betts, right? Freddie Freeman, right? We know what Max Muncy could do, right? You got yeah. Will Smith. I mean, on the other, on the pitching side, you have Julio, you have Clayton Kershaw, right? This thing, this team has, still has superstars. I mean, more more superstars than a lot of teams, right? <laughs> I mean, you can't go on on all the twenty nine teams and find this many superstars on a team. So the Dodgers still have a good team, right? And and like I said, they haven't even started playing. We don't even know what they're going to bring. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, they lost trade terms. They lost guys, right? Yeah. But like we said, this this is the time where you gotta you gotta play some of those young guys, right? I mean, did you know Trey Turner wasn't Trey Turner right when he when right right out of the gate, right? You know, all these guys weren't stars that right out of the gate, right? They they had they had the name, right? People were talking about them and. They had to see what what they were going to do, right? And that's that's the situation we're in right now. We have a lot of these guys that they have the name. Oh, this is this is a guy we're looking forward to see, Bobby Miller, or Miguel Vargas. Like these are the guys we're we're, we're looking. Now they got to come out and do their thing, and they become the guys in four or five years. Like oh man, we got these superstars in in, in these guys. You know, we got to let them play. Yeah, I mean whether we like it or not, the Dodgers now are on the same level as the Yankees where the fans now are going to be irrational with their expectations. I know you've talked about this before, Babyface. It's like they have to win the champion, the, the World Series, or it's a worthless, we, we wasted a year, right? Yeah. I, and and I, I had this conversation with a colleague of mine where they're just saying, well, if it doesn't work out, they're just going to need to blow up the whole thing. That's not going to, that ask Laker fan, how that feels that's not going to play in this city and it's not going to play with the dodgers if you end up blowing this thing up and starting from and you're not putting a competitive team look we've lived through the mccourt years we know how it is this city these fans de demand a competitive team it is a high st a high standard now and hey dodger your ownership is partly to blame for this like you guys put it out there that you want to feel the winner, a competitor every season. So now this is what the fans expect. And you know what? And Dylan had said this before. He had this conversation with Stan Caston. As long as Dodger fans keep showing up, Dodger ownership thinks they're doing a good time, a, a good thing. If things start going south and Dodger and Dodger fans stop showing up, which is hard because fans show up to this to support this team whether they're good or bad. You at least have 3 million fans showing up there. So it is kind of hard in the fact that you still have fans that want to go up there, but how else do you speak to ownership and say, hey, we're not happy. And you talk about this anger that's out there. I'm just curious to see what happens to that anger as the season progresses. If they get off to a good start, if they if they win, if you see, hey man, these kids are are panning out. This is going to be a good thing. Then maybe the anger subsides. But I guarantee you, what's going to happen is everyone's going to start bringing up last year, and they're all going to say, well, we won 111 games last year, and look what happened. So I'm going to take a wait and see approach. So it, it's I mean, it's a lot of things to look forward to in this season. That's you know that's how it's always going to be. You know, I mean. Like I said, first we, we gotta get to the season, right, and just see yeah. how it goes from there. And I mean, like we say, no, no pasa nada, right? No pasa nada. We just gotta wait it out.
But there is good news. There is good news for Dodger fans. What is that? I don't know if you saw it. MLB.com did a thing on – they predicted the, the next 10 World Series winners. Oh, that's who's, right. And who's going to win it all in 2023? The Dodgers are beating the, the, the Blue Jays of they're Toronto. Gonna, they're going to beat the Blue Jays, yep. So, so we have that to look forward to. According to MLB.com, Dodgers will be World Series champions in 2023. How accurate have their predictions been? Do we know? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they've ever – done that have they done that i haven't i, I, I don't know I but being, it. did you see the the winners that they predicted in the future years they're yeah like, they had the giants so winning one they, the they have jules winning yeah. one they have the mets winning next year over the orioles then the giants over the yankees mariners over the cardinals yankees over the cubs uh, this one seems way out there orioles over the dodgers in 2028 <laughs> And then the Tigers over the Braves, Angels over the Phillies, Red Sox over the Brewers, and then finally in 2032, the Guardians over the Reds. The Guardians are finally going to get their World Series. Those yep. poor bastards. But they got to wait 10 more years, though. Yeah, but, I mean, nobody ever <laughs> talks about those poor Guardian fans, you know? It's always the Cubs and the Red Sox before they ended up winning. Nobody ever talked about those poor, suffering well, Cleveland fans. Well, okay, if you put it that way, Cleveland. But now the Guardian fans, they, they've only been suffering for one year, so it's not that bad. <laughs> and they were in the playoffs, so yeah. it's like, come on. It's looking up. Exactly. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Bleed Lows podcast. Uh, again, here is the reminder. If you have just stumbled across this podcast, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast so you can catch all our episodes, get notified of when new episodes drop. Do the same thing on YouTube. You can watch all our episodes on YouTube. Plus, we also have YouTube shorts that are exclusive content for YouTube that we create. So you're only going to know about this if you subscribe. So make sure you subscribe to not only the podcast, but to our YouTube channel. You are sido su servidor, Juan Ramirez, de parte de mi colega, Babyface. This has been another episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast. This episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast has been brought to you by Bet Online where the game starts. Nos vemos para la próxima.